morning. Just got out of bed. Sunday. We do a little yoga and get ready to go to church. Then I uh, had a really weird dream last night. It's an interesting dream. I'm going to keep it to myself. But I want to talk about what is so problematic, so damaging about misogyny in, uh, in culture, and in particular when dealing with the issue of sexual assault. Because it's not just a crime against the actual victim of the assault. It's a crime against the victim's family. And this problem of misogyny and this issue of victim blaming, which is created by misogyny, is every bit as much harmful to men as it is to women. I'm going to explain what I mean here. So you have this sexist structure that says that if, if a woman, if, if, a, if a man assaults a woman, that you know, a woman allows that to happen, that it's because of, of how she was dressed or because of how she was acting or because she was drinking or, you know, or whatever it was. And all of these things are, fall are, are fallacies because, in fact, sexual assault happens whether or not these things are present. Frequently, you know, um, drugs and things are used to, to uh, facilitate a premeditated assault, right? But assault happens regardless of how you're dressed or how you talk or how you carry yourself or whether or not you come from a good family or whether a good family or whether or not you come from a broken, broken family or whether or not you're wearing a mini skirt or whether or not you've had something to drink or whether or not you're drunk, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. But what misogyny does is it tells the woman that it's her fault and it also tells the men that are in that woman's family that it's their fault and that they, but beyond the fact that it's their fault, they, that, that, What's their fault is that she wasn't protected. So it passes on the blame. It passes on the responsibility. Right? Saying that, you know, this, this person over here perpetuated this horrible crime against this, this woman that you love this, or this girl that you love, or this boy, I mean, young boy, boys, boys are victims of sexual assault as well. Um, or this person, let's just say this person that you love, and it's your fault that you didn't protect them. And so what becomes the result? The result is this victim blaming, because nobody wants to take responsibility and the only place that responsibility lay is with the perpetrator, with the predator. So when I started having flashbacks about um, things that had happened to me, you know, and I tried to tell my family about it, my father's response was, was indignation. And to tell me that it didn't happen. Because of this structure that says that a man is supposed to, is supposed to always be a protector and that if he falls short of it, that, that makes him less of a man.
is extremely cruel. It's so cruel. And society has, has compensated for this with this practice of victim blaming. That, oh, it was something that you, that you did. You brought it on yourself to be raped. And so, you know, Muslim men, Muslim extremist men take this, take this even further. Say, oh, no, your women, the women can't go out. And it is put back on the woman. And what that says, what that cycle says, is that a man is incapable of controlling his impulses. Instead of dealing with what the issue is, which is power struggle and control. My father is as much a victim of the assaults that I have experienced as I am. And I would say it's the same for every young woman who has experienced sexual assault at the hands of someone other than her father. woman I thought was a friend of mine and had, was telling her about my experience and she tried to be like, oh, well, was it your dad? Was it your dad? Because everybody wants to hear that. Everybody wants to hear, ooh, ooh, was your dad? Ooh, was incest? Ooh, was this? Ooh, everybody wants to hear that. I mean, people are fascinated by that kind of taboo, by that kind of perverseness. All right, so I ordered some new bras. They did not send me the size that I asked for. I specifically requested a 32E in both of the bras that I ordered. This one is a 32 double D. The other one is a 36 double D. The 36 double D is too big in the back and in the shoulders, like even on the tightest ring. This one, the 32 double D, fits me nicely around the back and in the straps, but as you can see, the cups are too small. You know what time it is? It's Jesus o'clock. <laughs> I can't wear a watch. I've tried wearing a watch, you know, numerous times throughout my life, but watches never ever keep time when I wear them. Within like three days, it's it's so off. There's no there's no point, and I won't wear a watch just to have a watch on my on my wrist. That's silly. But I will wear wear something that reminds me of Jesus. So. It's always Jesus o'clock. Last night, I uh, watched a couple episodes of the original Twin Peaks series. So Omar and I have been, have been re-watching this. When Twin Peaks was originally on TV, I watched this show religiously. It didn't matter what was going on in my life. I would make time to be home <laughs> when, when Twin Peaks was on. And David Lynch is a pretty interesting guy. Um, I've seen um, most of his work that is um, that's out there um, publicly. You know, I'm sure I haven't seen it all because you know you, you can never see all of an artist's work. You can never be sure you see all of an artist's work. But David Lynch is an artist. I mean, he has taken film 
and raised it to the level of film. You know, he doesn't make movies. David Lynch does not make movies. David Lynch makes films. And, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's an interesting guy. He's a, he's a Zen Buddhist, and um, there are a lot of parallels be between, specifically between Zen Buddhism and the, and, and, and the philosophy and teachings of Jesus Christ. You know, this whole, the first thing that, com that comes to mind to me is the, the idea of the Alpha and the Omega. Um, you know, the beginning, and, the beginning and the end, you know, to be the beginning and the end, somethingness and nothingness, all at the same time. You can call, call, the, call the teachings of the Alpha and the Omega a, a Christian koan, if you will. Um, and in David Lynch's work, he, he, he layers these beautiful, beautiful, seamless layers of um, symbolism and, and um, intellectual iconography and uh, spiritual practice and, you know, both, and you can see both, both, uh, the, both this from, from his, his Buddhist background as well as, you know, as a Christian, there's a lot of, of Christian overtones and undertones as, as, as well. And so it's really watching, watching David Lynch is an intellectual workout as well as, um, a practice in consuming aesthetic beauty. Now, there have been many critics who have have said um, about David Lynch that he's extremely misogynistic. Now, I will, as a woman, I will I will say that he does definitely represent misogynistic themes in in his in the work that he he creates. Um, but I'd be hard pressed to call David Lynch without knowing the man. I'd be hard pressed to call David Lynch specifically a misogynist without with, without speaking with him and getting to getting to know him as a person because you know art really is 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 supposed to be reflecting uh life um and and talking about reality through through um creative outlet right so you know misogyny exists within culture and society and as as an artist he represents this in film in a way that is um, quite quite profound, um, pronounced, uh, specific, um, and when I was younger, I didn't quite understand that. You know, if you're watching David David Lynch films, you know it was very it was very it's very interesting to me now looking back at this series. Um, and, and watching it again, I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, Kyle MacLachlan was one of my high school heartthrobs. You know, I loved Kyle MacLachlan, anything Kyle MacLachlan. And Kyle MacLachlan, of course, is, you know, he's a staple in David Lynch uh, productions. And going all the way back to Dune. Desert planet, not a drop of water. Anyway. Um, Dune was good. We watched that on, Omar and I watched that when we went on our honeymoon. <laughs> we were in Arizona and watched Dune. Anyway. Um, but, but Twin Peaks, uh, it's, it surprised, it's surprising now to look at it and think of it being on a major network channel because it is a pretty heavy hitting um, piece of artwork uh, watched in a whole. Now, when the series aired, um, at the time, there, there's there's two seasons or two and a half seasons or something like that, um, and David Lynch didn't direct the entire series, the original series. Uh, he had creative differences with the network towards the end of the series, and another director came in and finished the TV series. And at the very end, then there was there were there were illusions to coming back and revisiting the series in 25 years. And here we are, 25 years later, and in fact, there is um, the promise of uh, a new Twin Peaks series that David Lynch has been working on. And, you know, I was so enamored with the original series. Um, I mean, I read the books and everything, saw the movie, and um, I'm nervous about seeing the new series, but you know I'm gonna watch it. I mean, I couldn't let that go by without seeing it, you know. Um, but 
it's it's hard, you know, whenever there's a sequel or something, you know, is, is it going is it going to live up? Is it going to live up to the hype? Is it going to live up to what the original was? We're gonna we're gonna see. We're gonna see. So in preparing to watch the new series when it when it comes out, um, we've we've been once again watching the old series and oh, I see every time I watch it, there's something else I see. It's like it's like going to the museum and and seeing a painting, you know, a classic painting that you go back and visit over and over and over again. There's always something else. There's always something else to be to be seen. Um, and I have found myself having different relationship or emotion towards characters than I did when I was younger. And I think that comes from maturity and life experience. Um, but I remember uh, as, as a teen just being like, I felt really bad for the character Donna, you know? I was like, oh, poor Donna, she lost her best friend and all this other stuff's happening, blah, 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 blah. I'm watching the series now, as a, as a grown woman, I'm looking at this, I'm like, Donna, you made a lot of trouble for yourself. The character Donna, she made a lot of trouble. And, and, I don't know. It's just interesting. It's just interesting to observe change in perspective. Um, I always loved the character Audrey, and I still do. Audrey is is such a strong, powerful character. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting in in David Lynch um, films, in particular in in the Twin Peaks series, uh, is vehicle of of smoking uh, cigarettes um, and and the role that I mean, cigarettes are at, are are a character themselves. In, in these in these um, in this series and or in the original series we'll, we'll see how and if this character shows up again in the new series and you know as a person who who does consume tobacco um, you know throughout throughout my life you know I, I had my first cigarette uh, I smoked my first cigarette when I was 11 years old after um, after a sexual assault. Maybe it's twelve. Might have been twelve. Anyway, I was very young, and so so for me, there's, you know, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, smoked cigarettes uh, for a very long time. He was a real heavy smoker, and um, I had never been interested in in them. Um, like I said, until I had my first, until I had my first cigarette. And so I, I have an understanding of what that is. And, and, you know, also tobacco as a sacred herb um, of Native American people, not just Native American people, there are a lot of indigenous peoples all over the, all over the world. Tobacco is not unique to North America. Um, tobacco has roots everywhere, similar, similar to cannabis. Um, and tobacco with, um, with American history in particular is interesting because it, Tobacco and hemp were two of they they were the U.S.'s cash crops when the when the colonies were seeking independence um, and eventually won their independence from Great Britain and um, this this idea of leg, of legislation and in in California I think recently there was legislation that raised the legal age at which you can purchase tobacco to twenty one I I think this is a, a great idea. Um, because tobacco shouldn't be treated any differently than, than alcohol when it comes to legal, legal matters. Um, but, you know, see, seeing this in art, and as, as a teen, seeing teens smoke, there, there was unconsciously for me, and, and when the teens are smoking, because not all of the teens smoke, not all of them smoke, just some of them smoke, and... Um, and, and some some of the other adult characters do, and some of them don't. And see, seeing how how tobacco interacts um, and and when when it is present in in a scene, um, and, you know, subconsciously I think as a teen that was something that I related to because I had a similar experience with tobacco. Now there 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 is the flavor of tobacco. There's the nostalgia of tobacco and. 
you know, is tobacco in and of itself an evil thing? No, um, but misuse of tobacco is. And I remember seeing a um, seeing uh, a, a a medium, a, a spiritual healer when I was when I was in high school, and you know, she she was the first one to really um, pose this this idea to me of of. Um, respect for for the plant itself, uh, and she framed it um, as you know the exploitation of of native of Native American culture. Now, it's not uh, like I said, it's not um, tobacco is not unique just to Native American culture. There are other cultures that have used tobacco in similar ways um, traditionally, and and this is an issue across across the world and. Part of what the big problem is with tobacco is its propensity for addiction. And, you know, is that really, is it really just the nicotine? Um, I think it's less about the nicotine. Yes, nicotine is, is, is addictive, but I think it's less about the, about the nicotine and, and more about preservatives and additives um, that are used in mass production. I mean, tobacco, the Amish have been have been producing tobacco and using tobacco since since the Amish were came here to the United States. I mean, to this day. And I know as a child, I remember driving through the Pennsylvania countryside with my family. We 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 go on Sunday drives, you know. We go out to Amish country and after church and go have go have brunch at one of the at one of the country the, the country diners out there and. We go to the to, to the farms and we go see the quilts and oh my goodness, Amish quilts. Oh. But you would also drive through fields and fields of tobacco, and and at the time of year when the tobacco would be harvested and um, tied up and hung to dry, and they'd have the barns open on on either side uh, during during the day, and so you could see all of the tobacco hung from from the ceiling in in the Amish barns. There, there would be the the sweet aroma of tobacco on the air and. You know the, the quaintness of of the scenery, the landscape of of the of the farmers in their in their hats and their traditional their traditional garments in in the fields, and so th th there is a layer of wholesomeness too, and that's that that's what that what I think is difficult um, to uh, accept or or to um, digest. So to speak. Um, so I think when it comes down to it, just like anything else, sustainability and responsible responsible use and responsible propagation are 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 very are very important because when you start legislating away any kind of substance, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to to entertain the idea of prohibition of anything, you have, th th there's cultural impact. And so, so, you know, I think saying, you know, you have to be a certain age is, is a very, is a very good idea. And I also think that artists should not be censored in their, um, represent and how they, how they represent um, or if they if they use these things as as characters or vehicles in in their work, I, um, I do think it's important though to really prey on or meditate on how if if as an artist you're going to do that how you do it. So. That's one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in seeing in the new series um, is how does David Lynch treat the character of tobacco in in this in the new series? Um, how will that have evolved? Um, David Lynch, David Lynchy Lynch, he's so. Funny. I would love to meet him. I would love to meet him and have and and have lunch with him and. Just chat with him. He, his his work is very interesting to me, and like I said, I've seen a lot of it. Now, it's funny. He's one, he's one of my favorite directors. I, I would say David Lynch is my favorite director. Although, how can you say favorite? I mean, David Lynch is his own genre. <laughs> you can't you can't compare anybody else to David Lynch because 
there's nobody else who's like David Lynch. So David Lynch is my favorite. He's my favorite David Lynch. Um, <laughs> um, where was I going with that? Anyway, I'd, lo I'd love to sit and, and, and chat with him. Although that can be a, a very nerve wracking thing too, meeting your favorite artists or because like, you know, I, I love his work so much. What if I meet him and he's a big jerk? That would really bum me out. So maybe it's better just to never meet him. I don't know. Mr. Lynch, would you like to have lunch? Just a regular lunch. <laughs> you pick the restaurant. <laughs>
Mia culpa? Mia culpa. Tu culpa? Tu culpa. Either way. Salud. All right, so starting the bread here. This is a pretty easy thing to do. Um, this is a quick bread that I got the basic recipe for out of the Women's Day Cooking Encyclopedia. All right, so um, I'm not following their recipe exactly, but it, the, the, the basis of this recipe came from reading came from reading those those books. And the the Women's Day Cooking Encyclopedias are really cool. My grandma gave them to me. They it's like this whole collection, and it's broken out by. Um, area of the world so like you can look up any kind of any kind of food and has it has information about different ingredients and vegetables and things the other thing that's really interesting so these were published in the late 40s early 50s and it was at the beginning of of the the introduction of petroleum products into into the main market and synthetic uh, cooking products into the main market. So it's like there's recipes that, that they actually talk about Crisco and they talk about, you know, it was this introduction of these, of these, of these ingredients. Now I'm not going to be using any Crisco in anything here. Not that there's anything wrong with Crisco. Crisco makes one hell of a pie, of a pie crust, but, um, I'm not going to use that kind of shortening. Um, in my bowl right now I have one cup of water, three teaspoons of sugar, and a teaspoon of salt. And now I'm going to add, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I, I usually use Fleischmann's um, yeast. This time I'm going to use the Rapid Rise. I've never used, ooh, I hear Omar coming up the stairs. He's going to come up here and butt in. Um, I'm going to use this Rapid Rise. I've never used the Rapid Rise before, so we're going to see how that goes. Um, and I have one teaspoon of flour. Come on in. It's okay. Omar's coming up from work. Hey. Yep. I'm glad to be home. I'm glad you're home too. Um, so I'm gonna add this in here and um, I was baking bread one time with a little girl. What does the yeast do? How does the yeast make the bread rise? The yeast is a little organism, right? And it eats the sugar. So I got I got the flour and the sugar in here, and the yeast is gonna go in there, it's gonna start eating the sugar, and it's gonna start farting because it gives it gives the yeast gas. Oh, there's little gnats flying around from my compost bucket here. I let it get too full. Anyway, so dumping that in there. And I'm going to whisk it through and I'm going to add. Woo! That's what happens when you preheat your oven and don't turn on the fan. The fire alarm goes off. So I'm going to whisk. I'm going to whisk the yeast through. Let it start partaking of the buffet, so to speak. And now I'm gonna add my drizzle of olive oil. And, you know, I'm gonna be generous. I don't really, you know, none of this is really measured. The only thing I'm, I'm sure about the measurement on here is the water and the yeast. The yeast, because it comes, it came pre-packaged in the water because I measured it. But I, everything else I just kind of eyeball. So, you know, if you have too little salt, the bread tastes flat. If you have too little sugar, the bread doesn't taste balanced. You have to have you have to have both, and you definitely need to have the olive oil in there. Otherwise, your bread dough has a nasty kind of texture. It's kind of dry and crumbly. All right, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let that eat eat for a while. Let the yeast eat for a while, and about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and I'll come All back. All right. So while I'm still waiting for my. Uh, yeast to eat and fart over there. I mean, how rude. Yeast farting in my kitchen. Anyway, oven's preheating 425 degrees and the yeast is eating and farting. And I took four, you know, little baby Yukon gold potatoes and I sliced them up thin and I tossed them with about three tablespoons of olive oil, some Himalayan salt, some fresh ground black pepper, some uh, ground cumin and about a quarter teaspoon of uh, Bishop's weed and I, I've used this before uh, I've talked about it before it looks kind of it looks like this okay it looks like little little fennel seeds or even smaller tiny tiny little fennel seeds um, this is an Ethiopian spice and it is considered 
an invasive species here in the United States. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to go to hell for buying the bishop's weed. I don't know. Um, but it's tasty. Um, so, I said I was making a quiche. I kind of lied. I shall not lie. Um, I guess I'm a, I, I call this a quitata because it is a cross between a frittata and a quiche. Now, a frittata is like it's an Italian omelet that gets baked in the oven and it's got a layer of potato on the bottom um, instead, instead of a pastry crust like a French quiche has. So a quiche is, is an egg pie. Frittata is a, is a potato egg casserole. And I'm doing this in a pie dish and um, I call it a quitata. That's, a, that's an Americanized uh, thing. So I, I just, I'm gonna take all of these, these little slices and um, I'm going to line the bottom and sides of my pie dish. It's about a, this is a 10 inch glass Pyrex pie dish. And um, this, is, this is good spacing because the quiche or the quitata is gonna get, or the crust of the quitata is going to get baked at the same temperature as the bread. Now the bread's gonna take less time than the potatoes are. Um, the bread's only gonna take 20 minutes to bake, but the, but the, but the potato crust here is gonna take me, take about 40 minutes. I'm gonna keep an eye on it um, because it might, it might be a little less or it might be a little more than that. Just, you know, barometric pressure makes a difference. Um, and I, I don't have my barometer in here to tell me and I would know what I needed it to say anyway. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bake it until it starts to get crispy. I want the potatoes to be cooked before I put my other ingredients in the pan. So yeah, I don't know. I'm terrible at making quiches. A quiche, you gotta have just the right, just the right motion and the right balance and everything to get that right, to get just the right um, consistency and texture. So, you know, I guess maybe I'm lazy, I don't know, or maybe I just haven't gone through French cooking school. I haven't gone through French cooking school. I went through Karen Funyak, Anna, Anna Morrow, and Rose Funyak cooking school. That's, that's what I did. That's what I did. Oh, and I gotta throw my pappy in there. My pappy taught me how to make a few things. My pappy taught me how to make a number of things, and not actually for showing me how to do it, but by telling me what his mom used to do. Like, um, the first year that Omar and I had a crop of tomatoes, this was a number of years ago, I mean, we just had as many tomatoes as I have, as we have right now, we had like five times as many tomatoes. I, I, I was, it was ridiculous. I mean, ridiculous the amount of tomatoes we had that year. So I was just doing all kinds of stuff with them. I was drying them, I was making sauce, I was oh, I was making ketchup. And my pappy, he's the one who taught me how to make ketchup. So his mom used to make ketchup. He's also the one who taught me how to make tomato paste. I've never actually made the tomato paste. Um, it takes a lot of tomatoes and it is a physically arduous task. But he said his mom used to dry the tomatoes out on, on screens, and when they got to a certain texture, then she'd mash them, 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 and then that would all go through a sieve, and so then all the, all the um, seeds and the skins would, would come out, and, and you, should, you were just left with, it was basically sun-dried tomato pulp, but not to the point where the tomatoes were so dry that they were like raisins. So it was, you know, it was in between, and so they were still kind of mushy and pasty. Mm. Anyway. I'm gonna wash my hands. Um, so, potato line crust here, and um, I'm gonna check on this uh, yeast here too. All right, so there it is. The yeast has been farting. Now. 
the traditional, the recipe that was in, that's in, in the cookbook calls for three full cups of flour. And I find three cups of flour to be a bit much. And it might be because most flours today are enriched. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I usually end up putting in about two and two thirds cups. Um, and I, I put in the first, I'm putting in the first cup right here. And I'll whisk that through until I get a, a constant texture. And then I will use my hands to work in the rest of the dough. So starting off here, it, this kind of looks like it looks like a, a, a mother culture. Now, when you're making French breads, um, you need to ferment um, the, the more flour than what I used here to, to start to start my yeast. You, use, you have to use more. You have to use like an entire cup with one cup of water, and you let that ferment for a much longer time. But this is a quick bread, and I'm using a rapid rise yeast, and so this is lickety split. I mean, we're not even. I mean, this bread's only gonna, I'm only, only gonna let this dough rise maybe 20 minutes, if that, if that. And I don't even need to, I don't even need to. I can work this, work this dough and put it straight into the oven if I want, um, but I'm not going to. So, anyway. I'll come back after my hand, after I knead it and my hands are all full. All right, so here's my dough. This is just really minimal, minimal kneading very minimal kneading. You don't want to knead any more than you absolutely have to. Don't knead any more than you need. And the, that, the reason is that the more you work the dough, the tougher the dough becomes. You, you disperse, uh, you, 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 just, you, just, you push any air that's in there out and you, you make it all tighter together. The lignans get tighter. The lignans, that is the, the, the meat of the wheat, you know? That's what uh, celiac disorder is all about being allergic to that to that protein it's a protein a lignin so you don't want your lignins to get too short you want your lignins to stay nice and long I guess this is some bread yoga um, and I'm going to sit this off now um, to the side while I do some other things I'm going to sit it on my oven on, on the top of my stove and where that's already preheated but it's not going to go in the stove yet uh, and I'm going to cover it with a with a damp with a damp rag and while I do a couple other things. Like I said, it's only gonna rise like maybe 20 minutes. We'll see. Okay, so. Oh. I'm starting the base of my soup, and my bread dough is probably about ready. I'm gonna show it to you. Okay, here we go. Here's bread dough. I'd say it's it's it has risen or grown in size by about a third, and that's that's all I really need. Now I am not going to punch this down. You know I'm going to squeeze it a little bit and, and reshape it, um, but I'm not going I'm not going to punch this down. I have um, a pizza stone here. Now I have not preheated my pizza stone, but I am going to oil it right now. Just pour a little bit of oil. Like a teaspoon, if that, and just enough for me to smear around. I'm gonna use a paper towel to do that. Just to coat the the surface so that the bread doesn't doesn't stick to it. And I'm gonna take this dough here. Oh, it's nice and warm, and it feels satiny. And I'm just gonna work it a little bit together. I put the damp towel over it so it's not real crusty. If you don't cover the bread, you'll, the dough will dry and you'll get this weird crusty kind of... Crusty's only good once the bread's been baked. You don't want crusty, uncooked bread dough. That's gross. So I'm just, I'm just working this a little bit more and in, into a ball. So here we are. I got a bun. And I put it in the middle of my, of my pizza stone and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stretch it out like, like I was gonna make a pizza because I'm gonna make this into a in kind of like a flat bread that I can cut into wedges or strips that'll be good for dipping in into the soup. And I'm gonna get out a fork. I'm gonna poke some holes in it. And that's 
just to keep it from puffing up too much because I don't want it to be a big round loaf. I just want it to be a nice flat loaf, but I don't want it to be, un but it's not going to be unleavened, right? I mean, I've, I've let this bread rise a little bit, so this isn't, this isn't going to be like matzah. I'm not making crackers. And now I'm going to add a little more olive oil to the top. Rub it around like you're smearing desitin on a baby's bum. You know that stuff you use for diaper rash? Or for chub rub? You've got thighs that stick together. And now I'm going to sprinkle this with a little bit of salt and um. I got pink Himalayan salt in my little salt shaker here. That's what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna use. I cook uh, most frequently with Himalayan salt. It has a really nice balanced flavor. I use all different kinds of salts. You know, you can. I, I wrote an article a while back on on salt, and they do have different flavors. Um, but the Himalayan salt is, I prefer it even over the kosher flake salt. I mean, I got no need to keep kosher. Um, the other thing I, I have here, this is this is zatter, and zatter is a blend of oregano and uh, sesame seeds and, and other and other spices from the Middle East, and it's frequently seen sprinkled into olive oil for dipping your bread in. Um, it's also used to flavor a lot of different uh, Middle Eastern dishes, goes in, in salads and things, and I'm going to just sprinkle some on the top of my bread as, as well here. There you go. So I'm going to now pop this and my crust, my potato crust, into the oven. And the soup, it's it's not nearly as as intimidating as you might think it would be. So see, I'm gonna show you. Show you what's in the, in the pot here so far. So in that pot, which it's, this is one of those uh, Dutch ovens. Dutch oven. <laughs> Maybe I'll give Omar a Dutch oven tonight. <laughs> no, it's more likely that Sweet Cheeks or Kitty Pants or Sassy Lass is going to give us a, us a Dutch oven tonight. Why do they call it a Dutch oven? Are Dutch people gassy? I, I don't know. If you don't know what a Dutch oven is, look it up on your Urban Dictionary. I'm not going to tell you. So in this pot, um, <laughs> in this pot, I have about one cup of um, carrot chips. You can buy them processed like this in a bag already. You know, they're just like ruffle cut carrots. So I've got a cup of those, and I got. Half a bunch of celery, so I already used half of the bunch. It was an entire bunch of celery, washed it, used half of it. I had half of it left, chopped the rest of it up, put it in, into, the, into the pot here. I got about four tablespoons of ghee, and ghee is clarified butter. This is what it looks like, kind of foggy, and this is, this is Indian butter. It's what them Indians in India use in Pakistan. Clarified butter, it's just it's just butter that's been that's been um, heated and the fat and, and the fat solids have been have been removed and all you're left with then is the oil. So basically like if I were to melt this down, this is you know perfect for putting on your popcorn. Anyway, um, got that got that in here. And half a half a large onion diced up. Um, I got one inch, a chunky inch of, of ginger grated. I got about four garlic cloves minced. Um, I got one bay leaf. I got a cinnamon stick. I got some cumin seed. I got some more of that bishop's weed. I got some black ground pepper. I got some salt. And I have some, I have some veg, vegetable soup bouillon powder because I'm vegetarian. And I don't know. I might put some other things in there. I mean, you you can you can make your your tomato soup sweeter or more savory depending on what on what you're 
what your taste is. I'm not putting any hot pepper in this. Um, sometimes I put in, sometimes I'll put in a, a, a red bell pepper. Sometimes I'll put in some hot pepper, you know, um, have this great pepper mix. It's a Ethiopian pepper mix called Mita. Mit it's a, it's peppers and other, and other things ground up into a fine powder. Super spicy, really, really good. Traditionally served with their national dish, uh, which is called, um, Kitfo and Kitfo is a beef tartare. Basically, it's like really high grade beef that is raw and ground, and then they serve it with the mit mitta. But um, anyway, <clears throat> mit mitta is really, really good. I won't eat the beef tartare, but I will eat the mit mitta. Um, so I have all these things in, in the pot here so far. I want some salt, Himalayan salt. I have some, some Himalayan salt in here. And the next thing to do is for me to dice up my tomatoes. And how many tomatoes do I have? It depends on the size of your tomatoes. And it's like, I'm just making a pot of soup because I have a ton of tomatoes, because I grow tomatoes. I've talked about these tomatoes. Oh, I got them all washed here. So there's there's probably about 15, between 15 and 20 tomatoes in here of varying sizes. I don't know, what does this feel like? This feels like maybe eight pounds. Between, between six and eight pounds. So I'm gonna put between six and eight pounds of tomatoes in, in, into into this um, into this pot um, uh, and then I am going to cover the pot and I'm not going to add any moisture because I'm not going to need it the tomatoes are full of all the juice I need um, and I'm going to turn it up to a medium to medium high heat um, and check on it intermittently so I'm not gonna make you watch me chop up these tomatoes you know what it looks like to chop up a tomato. I'm gonna, I'm gonna chop, chop them pretty, pretty coarse. Not, not, not quite into quarters, but you know, not much more than that. The most important thing is to, rem is to remove the fibrous center stem. Um, and you'll see, there's, there's, there's another process to making this soup, but you'll, you'll see, you'll see. We'll get there. All things in good time. Okay. You remember what the pot looked like before? Now it's full of tomatoes, and I've sprinkled some extra black pepper on top, so. Come with me, as Bela Lugosi. No, no, Bela Lugosi would say, come to me, come to me. I'm saying, come with me over here. Over here. I'm gonna cook it up in here, up in here, up in here. Make tomato soup up in here, up in here, up in here. All right, whatever. So there's the pot on the stove. There's the lid. I'm gonna start me off with some high heat to get things going. got going on here is I'm gonna make me some faking bits. I don't know, it's probably some trademark term, faking. It's toe faking. I, I don't know. I'm making some tofu crumbly crunchies that are to mimic and take the place of bacon bits. So in my pot or in my bowl here, I have about two tablespoons of vegetable bouillon, vegetable soup bouillon powder. I have about a quarter teaspoon, that's nah, more like half a teaspoon of annatto, of ground annatto seed. And ground annatto seed looks like this. It has a pretty mild flavor and um, mostly I use it for, for color, um, but it does, have, it does have some flavor. It's like a mild nutty flavor, it's slightly sweet. Um, then I have, oh, the other thing that's, it, that's in this. Let's see, my, I got a cupboard up here. The other thing that I have in this is called Nechkemem, and it is an Ethiopian spice blend. And I got this one from a shop on Telegraph in, in Oakland. You know, spice blends are, are like curries or moles or whatever, or, 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 or zatters. I mean, everybody's got their own little secret, secret blend, and I'm not making my own, so I'm using somebody else's. But anyway. So I got that in here, I got some bishop's weed in here, I got some cumin in here, and then I have something called liquid smoke. This is the most important part when you're making fake bacon bits. The liquid smoke. I've talked about liquid smoke before, I use it in my collard greens. Anytime I'm doing something southern style that's supposed to have pork fat in it, 
I'll use olive oil and some liquid smoke to, re to replace that flavoring. And it does, a, it does a pretty good job. It does a pretty good job. Um, I also have about four, no, three cloves of garlic that have been minced up real fine. Salt and a little bit of salt and pepper. Again, I, I, I use the Himalayan salt. And I'm gonna use one of these bricks of extra firm tofu. And um, this is by Wildwood. And I like the Wildwood because they package it, you can get it in these duo packs that are already split and that's that's nice for two people this is this is enough the big the whole big brick is often too much so what am what am i going to do with this other half this other half is going to go into my quitada and that's for that's for texture it gives it gives the quitada a nice firm texture which makes it better for eating hot or cold you know you don't want something real creamy and mushy if, if you're eating it cold especially if it's egg unless you're eating custard and that's a whole different story but this is something savory you don't want you don't want a, a cold, savory custard. At least I don't. It sounds kind of gross. Um, the tofu adds a firmness to that. But anyway, we're not there yet. Right now, we're working on the fake bacon bits. So I have this this brick. Um, I also have about two tablespoons of olive oil mixed in here. And ooh, my bread's done. My bread's done. Hold on. Hold on. I'm gonna put this in there. Hold on. There you have it, there's the bread. It's all done. I'm just gonna sit it out to, to cool. Potato crust is still in there, crusting it up. So I, I put the, the, the brick in here, and what I'm gonna do now is take my, my not so grubby little paws, because I washed them. I know some people would be like, oh, you got nail polish on, you got nail polish on. Maybe I will, maybe I will, but you know what? You eat eight spiders a, a year in your sleep, they say. And when you got a sinus infection, your boogers run down your, down your throat and you're eating them boogers too. So anyway, I'm gonna put my nail polishy little paws in here and I'm gonna crush it up and make it into bits, 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 bits. I should have just used one hand. I'm being silly now. So it's gonna be similar to like a ground meat texture and the annatto seed is going to make it kind of a pink color. I'll show it to you in a minute here. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Make sure I get all of the stuff off of the bottom of the bowl here. So what am I going to do with this? And then I will take them off of that cast iron skillet, which I'm going to put on my gas stove here. You don't want to put a cast iron, you can't put a cast iron skillet on a glass top stove. So this is something to talk about because I've had glass top stoves. They're expensive and they're all like... Designers love them because they're like all sleek and smooth. If you cook, if you actually cook, if you do anything other than heat shit up, and I mean that, I, I mean like get processed stuff that you just heat up on the stove and mix up. If you actually cook, you don't want a glass top stove. They're expensive and they're hard to clean. You need special pans to cook on them because if you have the wrong kind of metal that touches that touches those glass top stoves, they crack. And I mean, they're they're a stupid, stupid investment. Do not get a glass top stove if you actually cook. Now, if you have somebody who just wants, like I said, wants to heat up stuff, heat, heat up canned soup, then a glass top stove is all for you. So all you all you bachelors out there, all you bachelors with your canned soup, with your chunky man meals, whatever the hell they are packaged up there, then you can have a glass top stove. You want to spend a lot of money and, and have a glass top stove, you can have a glass top stove. But I've, I've had a glass top stove twice. I don't ever want one again. The, the, best, the best thing, 
like my cream my jeans kind of stove is one that has a gas range and a convection oven and they exist one time we bought one but we couldn't install it because I didn't have a gas hookup but anyway that's the way it goes let's taste this and see how it is yeah I mean you can eat this raw it's, it's not you don't need to cook the tofu you can eat the tofu raw it's just the crispiness that I'm going for here let me wash my hands and I'll show you what this looks like So there you go. Woo! You get under the light so you can see the color better. See, it actually kind of looks like meat. It looks meat-ish. Meat-ish. I'll tell ya. I'm a big jerk. It's like quarter after nine. I'm still making dinner. My husband hasn't had dinner yet, neither have I. We're gonna have to stay up to like three in the morning in order to not be big fat cows, I guess. Because according to Oprah, you shouldn't eat after seven, right? I learned that from Oprah of the night. But anyway, here we go. My tomato soup. Remember what it looked like before? It's what it looks like now. I've turned the heat down a little, a little bit to medium from high. I'm gonna cover it back up here in a minute. And here I got my, my fake bacon on my uh, cast iron skillet sizzling away here to make the bits. Make the bits! The bits, the bits, the bits, the bits. All right, well, my potato crust got a little crispier than I anticipated, but that's okay. It'll be all right because I'm gonna, I'm gonna pack it in here. I'm not even gonna show. It to, I'm not gonna show it to you. I'll show it to you. <gasps> it's crusty. It's all right. It'll be okay. So this is what I'm gonna put into it. What's in here? As I pack this into this dish, I'll tell you what's in here. This is one of those half bricks of tofu and half a pound of uh, sheep's milk feta cheese that's been made with vegetable rennet, not animal rennet. It is a third of a pound of baby spinach chopped, very fine. One bunch of flat leaf parsley, chopped fine. Half of an onion, diced fine and some black pepper. Oh, and three cloves of garlic. So you can hear it sizzling as I press it into the pan. I'm gonna wash my hands and I'll show you what this looks like. Mm. Okay. Oh, and three eggs. Most poor part, three eggs. Now where did I get these eggs? I got these eggs from my neighbor who's got some chickens, so these are local. So there it is. So I'm going to pop this into the oven for probably another like 30 minutes while my soup is souping. And oh, oh, oh. There's my fake bacon bits. Looks like bacon bits, doesn't it? Mmm. Tastes like bacon bits. You would never know the difference. Oh, you might. Anyway, that's where we're at. Okay. Me and my weird red dots. I don't know, this, this has shown up. I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's a mosquito bite or a weird pimple. Pimple here too. 37 years old, pretty much like in menopause and starting it or, you know, whatever, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be 15 years old, 20 years old. I'm not going to inject myself with stuff to make me, I'm going to talk about this real. Me and my funky zits. Anyway. 
All right, so my quittata, it's in, it's in the oven still. Timer went off, but I added another eight minutes because it was still, uh, when I touched the middle, it was, it broke. That is not optimal. Um, but I'm going to talk about the soup. And then I'm gonna pretty much like end it until I take a photograph of the finished meal because it's late. And I'm hungry, my husband's hungry, I've been cooking and drinking. <laughs> so I'm a little tipsy right now. Got my babushka on. You call me tipsy gypsy if you gypsy, but if you ain't gypsy, don't you call me tipsy gypsy. Anyway. Here's, here's the tomatoes. What I'm going to do with this so I'm going to use this tool. This is called an immersion blender. My Aunt Roseanne gave this to me. My original immersion blender was a wedding shower gift from my Aunt Peggy. And then that thing lasted for, it was a KitchenAid, it lasted for what? It wasn't even a KitchenAid, it was an, it was an Oster. It, it lasted for nine and a half years. And then my Aunt Roseanne, she got me this one for, uh, might be my birthday or Christmas. Anyway, great kitchen tool. I have removed the cinnamon stick from the soup because it's too woody for this, but everything else was fine. I'm gonna stick this in there. I'm gonna blend the crap out of it. And then I'm going to use this. I don't know what this is actually called. I bought this when I made ketchup the first time. Um, and I also use it when I make jam. I used it when I made my plum jam. So uh, I will put this over a big bowl. It's got little hooks to hold on onto the bowl. And I will dump the tomato soup through that. And then I will crank it until everything but, the, but pretty much the skin and the seeds and maybe a little bit of pulp, you know, but not much. Um, have gone into the other bowl. That's my tomato soup. I will then dump it back into the pot. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. And then I will add probably about a third a cup of half and half and stir it through and then I will serve it. Tomato soup. Seems simple. But it's not. Even a good man breaks when a woman will bend. Even a good man lies when a woman will love. Even a good man breaks and in his weakness find shame. Even a good man breaks, but a woman will remain. My grandmother told me to find a good man, but she failed to explain. He wouldn't understand what a woman means when she says that she's fine. I thought everyone knew that was a line. Polite distraction from the unpolite fact that even good men break when a woman won't crack. She says that she's fine. I thought everyone knew that was a line. Polite distraction from the unpolite fact that even good men break when a woman won't crack. Even good men break when a woman won't crack. Even good men break when a
Yeah, that was good.